Good morning, everyone. My name is Nkemdele Mwaji Bell, and I am the CEO of FutureSoft. FutureSoft is an IT consultancy focused on delivering brand strategy, um, digital marketing, as well as digital transformation services to scaling enterprises. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've sort of learned on our journey is really that if you do not have, you know, buy-in from above, aka from your board, from your management, um, you're really not going to make any progress, right? Um, and, you know, it's kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, um, as opposed to having an actual strategy, right? And brand marketing really and truly is one of the most overlooked um, topics at the boardroom table, right? Um, I think this is sort of like a, a you know, kind of manifestation of marketing just being that thing that happens within the organization um, that people, you know, kind of don't really pay that much attention to because they don't understand it fully. Um, but on the other hand, also um, because a lot of organizations simply believe that, you know, marketing the same way that, you know, a lot of the time technology is looked at there's a head of marketing, there's a head of technology, they should sort it out um, and we don't really need to care or know. The truth is that um, in 2024, um, from a corporate governance perspective, you can't even think like that anymore, right? Um, there are a lot of risks that are associated with marketing, especially when it comes to your reputation, um, when it comes to, you know, sort of um, actually losing traction and losing customers simply because the customer experience is poor. And today we'll be touching on all of those different um, points and just really giving you an overview of the role of brand marketing in the boardroom and really also looking at how do we actually bring it into the boardroom, right? How do you elevate that discussion? Um, so if you're a board member and your board doesn't discuss marketing, what are the things that you need to start asking for? What are the things that you need to start looking at? And I'm joined by my colleague, Belay Keme, who is going to get us started with the session. Um, we'd love for you guys to ask as many questions as possible. Um, as the questions come in, you know, you can put them in the chat um, and we'll We'll treat them either as we go on with the discussion or at the end of the session. And, um, you know, we want this to, to be really interactive. So if there's anything that, you know, is very pressing, um, just put it in the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll try and answer it as we go along. So I'm going to hand over to Bella um, to share her screen and get us started. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, so like Kim said, what we're doing today is really from a place of what we've seen over the last, not even just a, a few years, quite a number of years, you know, and what happens with regards to businesses, organizations trying to grow their business, expand into new markets, build their brand. And then with the pandemic and everything, all the changes and everything that happened, um, before, during, and even after the pandemic with a lot of organizations even still struggling with it. So we're hoping that what happens with this um, masterclass is that you are able to see the reasons why it is necessary. And we will use a lot of case studies as we go along. Some of them will be some popular case studies that you guys already um, know about. And then some others will be the ones that from personal um, experience. So we're talking about marketing, shareholder value and risk, and the importance of board oversight, oversight on brand marketing. So a, a brief overview of what we'll be discussing today, we're going to introduce you to marketing. We're trying as much as possible to streamline things so that we don't overload you with too much information, but we're gonna try and make this as easy, as relatable as possible. Please begin to put together your questions on any of the slides as we go along, so that at the end, we're leaving a lot of time to take questions at the very end. So we're going to look at Introduction Marketing 101, Brand Marketing in Action. We've chosen a brand that we all know very well, and maybe if some of us are even joining this masterclass on an Apple device for that matter. And then the importance of marketing in the boardroom, we're going to look at elevating marketing 
in the boardroom and the critical alignments with business strategy. After that, we'll go into marketing excellence. We'll discuss marketing in the digital era and key components of effective brand marketing. We're going to turn it's difficult in 2024 to have any kind of conversation without looking at sustainability. So we're going to look at brand marketing and sustainability, the intersection, and how marketing is a key driver of growth and, and sustainability. And then, of course, the reason why we're all here, the role of marketing governance, what boards should look out for, and then a summary at the end of key learnings. So let's talk brand marketing. The what, the why, and the how. Strong brands enhance shareholder confidence, differentiation, and customer loyalty, whilst contributing to increased stock valuation. As we go along, you see what we're talking about. So marketing is not just about creating awareness, but it directly affects a company's financial health. Strategic, innovative, and well-executed marketing and communication campaigns, they can drive sales, increase market share, and ultimately enhance shareholder value. This is why board members need to understand the connections between marketing decisions and the company's economic success and sustainability. So if you think about it, how many departments or units really are there in an organization that have an overview of everything? To be able to deliver on any on marketing, you have to have a very good idea of what is going on around and um, within and across the entire organization. You have to understand what's happening with operations. You have to know what's happening with your revenue. You are directly in touch with sales, corporate comms, corporate services, HR. You are dealing with everybody across the organization. So which is why a lot of the time when marketing doesn't have a seat at the table, you can almost tell because the company begins to act in a way almost dissociative from its key stakeholders, which are its customers. And there was, there's an article that I, we can share this with you if you should you be interested, where there was a study by the Marketing Science Institute. And it was saying that companies who get easily disrupted are companies who don't have a good, a, a solid marketing team in place or solid marketing campaigns in place. So because of that, they do not understand what their customers are thinking. They don't understand customer, they don't understand customer behavior. Their customer journey is all over the place. And then their audience engagement is pretty much absent. So these are the reasons why it's important to understand the key role that marketing plays. So there's an intersection of brand, your brand, marketing, and shareholder value. So in this sweet spot, this is where the magic happens. Marketing, of course, for the core marketers uh, in the room, you have your seven Ps, or is it 14 Ps? Somebody was saying that they are now 28 Ps. You know, your product, place, price, promotion, and all of that. All of that goes into your marketing. Depending on how your organization is set up, you know, you might, you have some bit of, corporate comms, you have business development, you have relationship nurturing, you have, you know, all different um, departments who all plug into marketing. And then with your brand, under the brand, you have your brand image, your brand visuals, you have your brand story, you have your brand tone, you have your brand voice, you have your narrative. So this is essentially your why. A lot of your why is captured within the brand. And then shareholder value. At the end of the day, naira and copper, dollar, cents, whatever currency you want to think about at this point. And shareholder value ultimately is influenced by what you do within your marketing and what you do with your brand. We've kept it simple. Of course, there are so many other things that, play, that plug into your shareholder value or affect your shareholder value. But this masterclass is really for us to just show you how marketing is a key driver and why it should have more time in the boardroom and why directors should have better oversight of marketing because it will influence shareholder value, which is one of the, excuse me, which is one of the roles of the board to maintain and increase shareholder value. So we're going to, we're using Apple because historically, Apple is one of the global iconic and well-known brands that has managed to continue to reinvent itself. And with all the reinvention that has taken place with Apple, they still manage to retain shareholder value and continue to increase. They are now what's a trillion dollar um, company. And from the look of things, that isn't going to change anytime soon. And this is because we're gonna to speak to this later on, but this is because there is a lot of alignment 
between their brand strategy and their business strategy, and they never let you forget it. The Think Different ad campaign and, the, and to the Crazy Ones commercials that launched the Think Different brand marketing campaign in 1997 remains till date, even with all the brands that have come up and all the creative innovative brands that have come up, it still remains one of the most successful marketing campaigns of all time. We have a short video to share with you, but I'll just speak to the logo and then we'll watch the video. Just also give us some context, because I think it's important that we see these things from a perspective of where you are as somebody on this um, call, as a brand, as a business, and what could be if certain things are done. Of course, we appreciate that there are people, even from the responses we got with the questionnaire when you registered, there are people at different stages of their journeys. So we're going to try as much as possible to speak to people at the different stages of the journey. So believe it or not, this first Apple logo on the left in 1977 was the first logo that Apple launched with. I'm not sure how much you can see, but apparently this is an apple tree. And even though it's an apple, there's just one lone apple on the tree. And it's about to fall on somebody who in subsequent um, interviews with Steve Jobs, he said, maybe it's Isaac Newton. And he was waiting for Apple to fall with, by the law of gravity on his head. And he has a smart idea. Long story short, whatever it was at the time, this was the first logo that they came up with. And why we need to look at this from where they are now is, can you imagine the Apple that you see today? This is how they started. This is what they looked like when they started. Now they are clean and they are minimal and they are fresh and they're innovative and all of that. But that wasn't how they showed up at the beginning, you know? And then this logo, they had this logo for about 22 years and it didn't change until about 19, I think about 1997, which was when Steve Jobs came back. I don't know how many of you, how well you know the Apple story, but you know, he had problems with his board. They fired him. And then by the time they were struggling abysmally, they brought him back in 1997. So between 1997, 1999 and present, this particular logo has had some modifications. And when we look at these logos, it wasn't just about the logo. With the logo and all the brand visuals that were changing, which is what people think brand building or brand marketing is all about, the business strategy, the brand strategy was also changing. It was also evolving. So for instance, between 1999 and, and the present is when in 1997, they had the Think Different campaign, which kind of like launched Apple into this behemoth brand that it is now. And then fun tip, when there was an argument as to why there's the vice in the apple, it was because people thought that when people were shown in the focus groups at the beginning, they thought that the apple was a cherry. So they're like, okay, what is the best way <laughs> to show that this is really an apple? As we said, let's just take a bite out of it. And that's how um, the logo changed. Of course, the different colors, and then they became the clean, minimal apple that they are now. Okay. And Kim, can you, so I don't leave this window, can you please um, play the video? So for the, I hope we're able to understand what happened in the video. So to provide some context, that was Steve Jobs back in 1997 when the, the board begged him to come back because of all the problems that the brand was having. And he thought to himself, the entire team and the board thought to himself, what can we do at this point to come back from everything from where we currently are? So he did so many things. And if you look at it, the video of to the crazy ones, it showed people across different geographical regions, male, female, the young, the old, across arts, across music, across technology, people who flew into the moon and everything in between. So that we're trying to go as broad as possible to be able to speak to as many people as possible. So some of the things that he did for Apple beyond just being a campaign was that he reinforced the brand identity, reinforcing Apple as an innovative and visionary company. It celebrated those who think differently and positioned Apple very firmly as a brand that values creativity and individuality. This entire campaign contributed in no little measure to the brand that Apple is now. And one thing he did for the brand was the loyalty because the price point, which was very high, was no longer a problem because people are like, okay, I think different. I'm a crazy one. 
I'm a genius. And they, they began this whole cult following for Apple that continues to this very day. It invoked an inspirational and emotional connection because it featured influential figures who had changed the world in no small measure, inspiring viewers, like I said before, to embrace their uniqueness and think beyond conventional boundaries. And one of the things also did was a lot of people within the creative space, I think that might still be the history of why till now, a lot of people in the creative and tech space still use Max because at the end of the day, beyond just the message of thinking different and being innovative and all of that, the actual consistency across the products, the brand experience, the customer journey kept on pushing people towards their why, towards their values. And that was why it was easy to achieve what they achieved um, in that manner. The strategic restriction in the market, I already mentioned that before, this campaign, it was it set the stage for the turnaround that Apple had and then the evolution into this global um, powerhouse. Next slide, please. Cultivation of brand loyalty. I've spoken to this already, you know, because a lot of people became long-term advocates for Apple, becoming loyal customers. We've all seen, I'm sure we've all seen videos of people queuing up outside Apple stores hours, sometimes even a day or two in advance to get their hand on the latest Apple um, device. Like even now, I know that the world had touted that, oh, what's going to happen with these VR goggles? But apparently the queues remain and people are actually buying the VR goggles regardless of what the critics said about it, the price points, usability, and all of that. Sales and market share growth, as well as global recognition and memorability, it was memorable. It was memorable. It wasn't easy to forget. And that is one thing I'm trying to find a respectful way to say this. A lot of Nigerian brands, African brands are not memorable. We all do the same thing. Sometimes if you take out the tagline or the name of the brand in an advert or in a campaign or whatever, it might just, it could be anybody because everybody sounds alike or most brands sound alike. Most brands look alike. Most brands do the same thing. Believe it or not, in Kem and I have come up with fantastic strategies for clients only for them to say, do you know what? I like what this competition is doing. Why can't we do something like that? You know, times like that, we want to scream as in, but you are different. You're, what, what is unique to you? Why do you want to sound and be like your competition? That might be your problem that you want to sound and be like the competition. So for sales and market share growth, it laid the foundation for Apple's subsequent um, product launches from the iMac, the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. In fact, after I think by um, different campaign, Apple was just on a roll with churning out products, which we have used and loved till this day. Next slide. So now let's talk about the importance of marketing in the boardroom. And again, as we, why we use the Apple um, case study, what we're using the Apple case study is we hope that as we go along in these slides, you can see actual implementation, just in case you can't picture at this time how execution would work for you. But we're hoping that by the end of the masterclass, you would have learned enough to say, okay, this is exactly what we can do and how we can turn things around. So like we said earlier, marketing shapes corporate strategy by identifying opportunities and connecting with customers. It's still unbelievable to me how people come up with entire corporate strategies without marketing's input and then just say, okay, marketing, you have these two slides are for you. And then when marketing begins to flounder and then when they don't get the results that they are looking for, they wonder what the problem um, is. So the risk of ineffective brand marketing cuts all the way from reputation, reputational risk. This can happen through miscommunication, misalignment with your values, or the creation of a negative brand image. So usually the way it should work is, like Steve Jobs in the video was introducing a brand marketing campaign. It was because there was an overarching business strategy over the next couple of years, cutting across everything from products to um, market expansion to even the kind of de um, developers that are going to be working with and all of that, you know. So it was based on all of that, that the brand marketing now aligned and was able to deliver on the results the way, um, the way they did. So sometimes I'm trying, I'm going to be mindful of time, but we'll speak to this at the end when we start answering the questions. Misalignment with values is also a very, very, very big one. And in these days of influencer marketing, we see brands sometimes who pick influencers that I struggle to understand why they have chosen that particular 
influencer you know influencers might be popular they might get you likes and all that but what does it really do for your brand in the short term maybe a bump in sales but what does it mean the medium term and the long term does it alienate any other key stakeholder group simply because you want to be popular with a particular stakeholder group you feel you can drive sales through loss of market share poorly executed marketing strategies may fail to resonate with the target audience leading to reduced market share I have to tell you guys the story. I think it was, was it last year in Kim or two years ago, the Balenciaga one, where children, they painted them, you know, they had them dressed in this very haunted way, almost looking like uh, BDSM dolls and all, you know. The clothes were great. I mean, Balenciaga designs amazing stuff, you know, but the entire campaign was just, it left such a bad taste in most people's mouths. And then, believe it or not, the marketing team actually said the CEO made a statement saying that he didn't he didn't see it he didn't approve it can you imagine throwing everybody under the bus in that manner I think it was just a case of it wasn't me he, it was just at a loss of what to say exactly and then there was serious council culture even the Kardashians who are very big ambassadors for Balenciaga suffered so much backlash that they had to one by one come out to give statements about it saying oh we all have children and all of that but there was, there was lots of market share. I've not been able to check to see if it has come back, if it has, it has bounced back, but they were they suffered last year. And for the luxury segment that was already suffering post-pandemic, it was a very big hit to Balenciaga that had kind of like um, rode the wave. Customer dissatisfaction and negative feedback. This could lead to reduced customer retention and can be directly linked to misaligned brand marketing. So one thing I'm going to reiterate is when as a brand, you begin to come up with your strategies and everything, you must look at your entire stakeholder groups and say, okay, this thing we are about to do, this direction we are about to go, why are we going there in this direction and how we communicate the direction that we are going in? Because a lot of the time with marketing not being aligned with corporate strategy. Corporate strategy is saying, okay, digital transformation, we're going to be digital, we're going to lead innovation and all of that. And then marketing is stuck on radio and is using an influencer who maybe is 50 years old, looks good, appeals to maybe some board members and some management team, uh, some uh, members of the management team, but really doesn't deliver on what the brand is trying to achieve. So customer dissatisfaction is real. And if your brand caters to the millennial, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and all the different segments after millennial, uh, generations after millennials, then the cancel culture is very real. They will cancel you, not look back, and vilify people who don't cancel you along with them. Competitive disadvantage. The inability to differentiate from competitors or highlights unique value proposition. I'm hoping that this is one of the things that we take away from here, even at board level, you know, to ask the question, what is our unique value proposition? A lot of the time, you know, we are in rooms where the founders or the legacy um, staff know exactly what the brand is about, what the proposition is, but the head of marketing, corporate comms, the people on the ground have no idea. And you wonder why there is a disconnect between what the brand is about and what people, um, what, uh, consumers are seeing about the brand. So this is something that is hurting. And I feel like if Nigerian brands were better skewed towards market research, I feel like this is something that will be highlighted more clearly than it's, it's being done now. And then of course, financial implications, inefficient use of resources due to poorly executed campaigns, wasted marketing budgets. Oh my goodness, how much time do we have on this class to talk about wasted marketing budgets? I'm not going to mention names because the influencer is now a friend, but a brand used a particular musician. They paid him all in between all the perks and blah, 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 two years before the pandemic. So this was what, maybe 2019. They paid him 25 million. And for the one year, they never used him. Believe it or not. So he looked good. Somebody must have thought he was a fantastic idea. But as they came up with campaigns and they came up with different things around their brand marketing, they really didn't find any use for him. So that was 25 million that I'm very sure some other people would have loved for it to have been directed towards the programs that um, 
they had in mind. And then of course, decreased RI, we'll speak to that much later on, and then challenges in justifying marketing expenses to stakeholders. So yes, the marketers in the room, this is a very big problem we'll tend to have when it's difficult to justify. And sometimes it's simply because the information hasn't been presented in the manner that it is strategic and speaks to the overarching business strategy. But in the defense of brand marketing um, units and corporate um, communication and all of that, a lot of the time it is because the board and management hasn't done a very good job of trickling down the information of the strategy beyond a need to know basis. So how do we elevate marketing in the boardroom? The role of marketing in shaping corporate strategy. So marketing helps you to identify marketing, market opportunities, understand consumer behavior, and guide product development. Please do not create one more product if you don't know how your target audience feels about it. Ensuring that the company's offerings resonates with the target audience and your growth ambition. A lot of the time we see when organizations focus on the now, and then even though they say growth ambition, they haven't put anything in place. There's no foundation for the brand to be able to grow beyond its present point. We can see with the Apple example, they simply had to move away from, by the time they started creating expensive um, devices and um, them speaking to innovative software developers and all of that, they had to move away from being an archaic old fashioned brand to being clean, minimal, forward thinking and all of that. So ask yourself, as a brand, as a business, is it time to change our logo? Does our logo still speak to who we are and where we want to go? Marketing can impact shareholder value. This is because well-executed marketing campaigns, we can see with the Think Different one, contribute immensely to revenue growth, market share expansion, and increased brand equity. There's also an influence on investor perception and confidence, as well as a direct impact on the company's stock performance. They have situations where just by the tweets of the CEO or a founder, there's a dip in stocks. And that is because that is the, 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 the CEO or the members of the board, their reputation and what they do has a direct effect on the businesses that they manage or that they lead. So again, this is how marketing cuts across different things within an organization and which is why it should be held um, in high importance. The board has a responsibility in overseeing marketing decisions. We've said this, but for emphasis, boards must ensure that marketing strategies align with the company's overall goals and ethical standards. Again, for this to happen, there has to be the two-way conversation. In your organization, what is the flow between yourselves and the branding and marketing um, departments? Is there a free flow? At what point do you know about the campaign? Or do you, like many board members, find out there's a new campaign when there's a billboard or when you see an ad. Effective board oversight involves reviewing marketing reports, tracking the metrics, asking critical questions. I mean, that's why you're there. Evaluating risks and endorsing initiatives that contribute to long-term success. Next slide, please. Aligning marketing with business strategy. There is an absolute need for coherence between marketing initiatives and overall business objectives. We've mentioned this before, an understanding of company goals is key to ensure that the relevant teams ensure that all their efforts are purposeful, contributing directly to the company's mission and vision. And most importantly, so that on the other side, the calculation of the return on investment is clear and is easy to understand. And that way you can build proper trends within the organization for yourselves internally, as well as um, across industry and sector. Marketing and strategy alignment is essential to ensuring a connection between marketing plans and broader organizational goals. There are some times when a company might have reputational damage or something that's going on, and marketing can actually leverage that to create campaigns that end up adding value to the business and to the brand um, equity. Target markets and competitive positioning this should guide marketing decisions to set the brand apart in the market. Like I said earlier, I will repeat it for the benefit of those who joined um, a bit late, is that with regards to, excuse me, with regards to your target market and competitive positioning, you need to understand your values. Why do you exist? Like Simon Sinek would say, what is your why? Why do you exist? How do you communicate your why? How do you communicate your values? Is it consistent? 
if you say your value is innovation, are you innovative today, a cake tomorrow, bureaucratic the day after? And people are just so confused that when they find somebody who is better positioned in the marketplace, they leave. The people always say that, oh, millennials and Gen Z, they are not loyal to their brands. Well, that's not true. It's because they want to engage at an emotional level. And a lot of brands are struggling with that audience engagement. Efficiency and resource maximization. Spoken to this a bit, but this is through current alignment and enhanced operational efficiency to prevent fragmentation, ensuring a more focused brand marketing approach. And then again, consistency is key. Repetition builds brand sustenance, reinforcing a consistent brand image across all touch points. It builds your brand trust, it builds recognition, and it builds resonance with the target audience. Think about it. If you saw an ad without Nike having their logo there and saying, just do it. And you saw athletes running, everybody is you know, trying to outdo themselves and win. And they ask you to choose. Nine out of 10, you will choose Nike simply because they have done a fantastic job of reinforcing that image of you can be whoever you want to, you can do whatever you want to do. And like Steve Jobs said, all they do is sell shoes. Next slide, please. Okay, at this point, I will hand over back to um, and Ken. Please, like we said, you can start putting your messages, um, your comments and um, questions in the chat so that we can keep track of them when we get to Q&A. All right, thank you so much, Bella. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about marketing excellence and really kind of focus on how do you actually oversee and make sure that the implementation of your innovative customer focused strategies that drive brand value and resonate with your target audience are actually contributing to your organization's success, right? So, you know, you can come up with fantastic campaigns, but if they're not targeted and tailored properly to your goals, then they're pretty much useless. Um, so one of the things that, you know, we also have noticed is that at board level, a lot of board members don't actually have enough knowledge to really understand what marketing excellence is right and that's perfectly fine but it means that as a board you also then need to kind of think about how do we achieve this right are there courses that our board members can take are there trainings that they can do how do we ensure that we have the right skills both at board level as well as at the level of the marketing team right so when you look at sort of key components for effective brand marketing people is very, very high up there, right? You have to have a team with diverse skills um, because at this point, right, brand marketing is so vast um, and it cuts across so many different aspects, right? There's the visual aspect of the brand. There is the, you know, sort of communications aspect of the brand. So you need good communicators, good writers. There is the strategic aspect of the brand, right? Who is actually creating that brand strategy? There is data analysis. If you're not actually looking at, you know, sort of the data, are you even doing marketing, right? Um, that's really, the, for me, the biggest question. So making sure that you have these diverse skills and ensuring also that they can be translated into reports that make sense at board level, right? A lot of the time when, you know, as an agency, you create reports for your clients, you're, you know, focused on the things that you would track, but are those really the KPIs that the business is tracking? Are those the things that will, you know, let them know whether they're delivering success or not? Um, so it's really, really important to, to sort of make sure that you have the right people and the right mix of people in your team, as well as if you're using an agency, that they have the right mix of people and that they also have that strategic element of strategic thinking, right? There are a lot of agencies that can deliver great campaigns um, with fantastic graphics, fantastic videos and things like that. But the strategy for that didn't come from them, right? So strategy is one of those things that you really need to look at who is going to develop this strategy and who is going to drive it. Um, I've already sort of alluded to having directors with marketing experience, right? So if you have directors that have marketing experience, they can really bring invaluable insights, right? Um, and also help in shaping your marketing strategies and making sure that you have a higher shareholder return um, as you execute them, right? And they can really sort of bridge that gap between 
the strategic vision and the marketing real market reality, right? So how do you actually implement and how do you make sure that it resonates? How do you make sure that you're getting a good ROI? Um, also, I think that there's a huge intersection between marketing and the rest of the operations of your business, right? Which means that you need a team that is agile, adaptable, innovative, that understands the entire, you know, sort of dynamic business landscape and really understands also how quickly marketing is changing, right? So when you think about, you know, just in the last 12 months, how AI has really driven massive, massive changes in in, in marketing, right? Massive, massive changes in how you would even structure an agency, how you would even structure your marketing team, because you can now co-pilot, right? So you have a powerful assistant that can do the work of 100 people, right? So the question is, do you need as many people? How are you going to leverage that innovation? Then there's also obviously also your customer experience, which you know a lot of people are like, oh, but marketing is not customer experience. The truth is that they go hand in hand. Marketing is used for lead generation, for example, right? If the landing pages that, you know, the leads are being driven to don't convert, then that is poor customer experience, right? If they don't have the right type of information that they need at every stage of the marketing funnel, that is poor customer experience, right? So you also have to look at how you actually align your um, your customer journey with your brand marketing strategy. It's very, very important. And in order to, you know, sort of keep abreast with all of these things, you need to make sure that your learning and development strategy has a very deep element of marketing, right? So both at team level, um, both at agency level, but also at the board level, because it's constantly changing. Um, so you have to have continuous L&D um, opportunities for your marketing and comms team. At the board level, you need to make sure that they really understand marketing governance um, and that they are equipped with the ability to ask the right questions, right? And really think about marketing from a strategic perspective and really also understand the numbers that they're looking at, right? That understand what is reach, what is engagement, what is conversion? How do we even track that? How do we track the customer lifetime value? How do we track our customer acquisition cost and things like that? Those are terms that a lot of board members are not necessarily familiar with, right? So you need to make sure that they have that knowledge and insight so that they can then question the um, the the reports, right? And a lot of the time we we find that, you know, because marketing is a lot of digital, it gets pushed under the IT committee, right? So depending on who is in your IT committee, you know, you may or may not have the right skills because if the, the people on the IT committee are really focused on infrastructure, focused on cyber, they're not necessarily going to understand reputation. They're not necessarily going to understand, um, you know, marketing campaigns and, and how marketing actually can be a strategic driver for your growth. So it's important that you are able to balance and you know sort of build those skills very carefully. And then obviously my favorite topic, um, data technology, AI, machine learning, anything that's um, you know sort of tech driven um, is very, very important for brand marketing, right? So Bella already sort of talked a little bit about data analytics and insights. Um, there are tons and tons of tools out there that really provide valuable insights into your customer behavior um, and the customer journey. And that allows you to make very informed marketing decisions, right? It allows you to also um, really look at who is my target audience, right? Um, how do I actually engage them? What point do they drop off? Um, you know, what are the things that are going well? What are the things that are not going well? And it allows you to then also sort of look at, okay, what parts of this can I actually automate, right? So marketing has a lot of repetitive tasks, right? Bella already said repetition is how you build a brand, right? Um, and a lot of that you can actually automate. So you, as you sort of plan your digital transformation journey, you also need to look at how do you, you know, sort of automate your MarTech stack, right? So that's your marketing technology stack. And how do you make sure that you are really thinking about automation from a perspective of personalization and targeted marketing campaigns, right? And obviously that's also where AI kind of 
um, plays a really big role, but data analytics also do, right? So if you are a financial service organization, right, you probably have different types of customers. You have HNIs, you have students, you have, you know, sort of um, people who are mid-level career, you have people who are retired. They all require very different services. Um, and because they require different services, they also, re and they also are all from different generations. Um, which means that they all speak a different language. So if you don't actually use that data that you have on them to actually personalize um, your marketing and your comms, you will not see any results because, you know, when you use Gen Z speak to talk to a baby boomer or a Gen Xer or, or even a millennial, they will be very confused at what you're even saying because that language is just very alien to, you know, anyone that is um, not a um, not part of Gen Z, right? Um, and vice versa, right? You use a campaign directed at Gen X or baby boomers to talk to even a millennial, they will be like, why is this, this sound so old fashioned and what exactly are they trying to say? Um, so it's important to really look at how do you leverage data analytics and AI to really understand the individual consumer preferences um, and also deliver tailored content and experiences, right? And then obviously on the technology side, there's also, you know, sort of tools that you can use for not just social media management, but really managing your digital channels across board, right? But it's really critical to making sure that you have um, these type of tools so that you can schedule content, you can monitor, um, you know, your how your campaigns are actually doing. You get a lot more data out of these tools than if you use the platforms directly, right? So depending on obviously how big your company is, you may want to look at what are the tools that I can invest in, right? So not everyone, you know, can afford kind of, you know, big tools like Meltwater, but, you know, there are smaller tools and, um, you know, more affordable tools for SMEs and, and smaller businesses. But these also need to be, very st strategically used. If not, you also, you know, run the risk of having spend across multiple tools that do the same thing, right? And Bella already sort of alluded to, you know, um, wasting financial resources being a big risk that boards actually need to flag, right? So what does your marketing stack actually look like? What are the tools that you're using? What do they really do, right? Do you, um, have a CRM. If you have a CRM, how is that actually connected to all the other tools that you have in terms of your, you know, email marketing tools, your social media tools, and how does that data come out of there and how do you analyze it, right? Boards should have clarity on how that process is managed and what data we're collecting um, and how we're actually monitoring that data, right? So this also means that you need a really good interplay and collaboration efforts between your data team and your marketing team, right? I think when it comes to brand marketing in 2024, if you don't have collaboration between teams, you are basically, you know, dead on arrival because it just cannot work. Um, technology, product, customer experience, right? Um, marketing and data. If those and operations as well, if those, you know, sort of six units are not all playing together, then it doesn't work. And what we see, you know, in, in companies like Spotify, for example, they actually co-locate the players from each of these teams together into units um, as opposed to having teams sit together. So they don't have a marketing team that sits together. They have people from marketing sit in different teams that deliver different products, that deliver different pieces of their operations and their customer experience, right? Um, and in all of these teams, they also have a person from product, they have a person from ops, they have a person from data, they have a person from technology. And that way they are all together and co-creating and talking to each other and understanding each other's work, right? Because the truth is that if you're in technology, you probably don't understand, you know, what marketing campaigns are and to use just like okay, they put adverts and then we get customers. We just need to make sure that the app is working, right? But the truth is that no, because if your app isn't designed in a way to actually 
ensure that the customer has a good experience, then you, you know, no matter what marketing does, they will never be able to be successful because wherever they're driving traffic to isn't set up to actually convert, right? Um, so it's important to have that, you know, sort of interplay. Then also predictive analytics um, with machine learning are really, really um, important because you can use them to anticipate your market trends um, and, you know, sort of, I guess, optimize your, your marketing strategies overall, right? Um, so it's important to also ask those type of questions, right? What role does technology play in our um, marketing, brand marketing efforts? What role does AI play, right? Are our people learning? Um, do we have the right people? What agency are we using? How did we choose that agency? Why did we choose that agency? Is the agency still relevant for us in today's world, right? Um, you know, do they have experts that do digital, for example, right? Do we have digital experts on our team? A lot of CMOs as well, right? They come from traditional marketing because obviously you need to rise through the ranks in order to become a CMO. Um, so you rise through the ranks and then suddenly you're in this, you know, whirlwind where it's like everything is digital and you, you know, don't really know a lot about it and you have to go and present to the board. And if you have a digital board member that understands marketing like me, then you, you know, will be asked a lot of hard questions that you may or may not be able to answer, which means that you need to make sure that you have the right people on the team that can also ensure that you're growing as they're growing and that you ensure that you have the right type of um, reports coming out and you're tracking the right type of KPIs. So um, we'll go over to brand marketing and sustainability. So I think when we think about sustainability, you know, there are buzzwords like ESG that come to mind. Um, and I think overall, brands are all looking to contribute to a more sustainable and responsible um, future. But how do they do that, right? Um, the reason why we've put this in here is because this is really sort of the future and evolution as well as current state of brand marketing, right? If you're not positioning for sustainability, if you're not using your brand marketing to really um, meet your customer expectations in terms of sustainability, then, you know, what are you really doing? So marketing can be a driver for growth and sustainability, right, in terms of long-term value creation. So when you use marketing, right, you can really extend beyond sales and profit generation. Um, and brand marketing can be designed and deployed to really build enduring relationships with your customers and contribute to sustained business growth. And when we go back to the um, Apple case study, right, that is exactly what they were able to achieve with that, right? They created long-term value. And, you know, this was 1997, Right. So if you really think about it um, soon, 30 years from now. Right. Um, and still every single thing he said, even the, um, you know, sort of marketing terms that he used in, in that video are relevant today. Right. Um, and that, I think, shows you that brand marketing, yes, it has evolved. And yes, technology has, you know, sort of disrupted it and, and you know, changed it and made it more accessible to more people. But what makes a brand is still that connection with your customers, connection with your stakeholders. So you need to really look at how do you actually um, create long-term value and how do you make sure that you build those customer relationships that contribute to sustainable business growth. And that's the same thing with brand loyalty and customer lifetime value, right? Um, as a board, if you're not measuring your customer lifetime value, you are missing out on a really, really good metric that um, you know really helps with indicating long-term financial value that the, that customer brings. Um, so it's a really important metric to track and you need to track it across your different target segments, across the different types of customers that you have. And this is where data comes in, right? So if you're not, if you don't, if you're not collecting data, right, then you also are not going to be able to actually calculate your customer lifetime value. You're not going to be able to calculate your customer acquisition cost. Um, you're not going to be able to really estimate, you know, sort of like how well are we doing when it comes to brand loyalty. So it's important to really think about, you know, the sustainability of your business as you think about marketing, because brand marketing can help achieve that. It's a really big lever that you can pull. 
alignment with business objectives, right? So sustainable marketing also makes sure that your promotional efforts are consistent um, with your company's long-term mission, vision, values, and ESG and sustainability ambition, right? So, you know, Bella talked about making sure that you are your brand marketing strategy aligns with the business strategy, aligns with the mission, aligns with the goals. Um, and it needs to align with your sustainability ambition as well, right? So whether you call it ESG ambition or your sustainability ambition, it is all sort of focused on that long-term value creation. Um, and also make sure that you're sort of integrating societal values in your, um, in your brand. Because the truth is that customers have expectations um, and customers want specific things from um, you as a brand. They want to make sure that you're socially responsible, right? That you're environmentally conscious. Um, and we've seen a lot of black backlash. You know, Bella talked about the Balenciaga campaign. That's just one of the campaigns that was just like, it just went so wrong. Um, where you know you just ask yourself what were they thinking right um and how were was their governance structured where was the approval process why were they able to you know actually go live with this type of campaign at such a big event without you know any kind of approval from the ceo it just seems really really crazy right but that just also shows you that if you are not paying attention to what is important to your customer, then you are exposing yourself to reputational risk at the highest level. So you need to really think about, you know, sort of the um, intersection of brand marketing and co corporate sustainability from a point of view of, do you have alignment with corporate values and your sustainability ambition, right? And how are you communicating that? How, how does that translate, right? So there is um, a really great um, campaign that launched, this must have been also pre-COVID, um, probably in 2019 or so. And I remember taking pictures of it and sending it to Bella and being super excited. And the campaign is from Total Energies. So Total, we all know, um, an oil and gas company really focused on, you know, sort of oil and gas, right? But obviously, when it comes to ESG and sustainability and the energy transition and the journey to net zero, they needed to really reposition and rebrand, right? And what did they do? As part of their rebranding, they really looked at what, what do we need to do, right? And from Total, they went to Total Energies, right? And it's such a fantastic play on words. And, I, you know, I kind of feel like whoever coined that should really be given a million dollars because it is gold, marketing gold, right? Um, and they basically launched in on different mediums, right? Um, they used sort of like very fresh and colorful um, images showing a lot of renewable energy, right? Um, but they didn't only show renewable energy, they showed a mix of different types of energy sources that they would continue to, um, you know, work on, right? Brown energy, as well as renewable energy. And all of that makes total energies, right? And when you read their press release, you know, it's like one of those goosebump press releases, um, if you're a marketing person. <laughs> And, you know, it it just really shows that they really thought about every single thing. When you look at the website, the ESG ambition is clearly communicated on every single page of that website. Same thing within that press release, within, you know, all the different um, expressions of that campaign. So when you think about it from that perspective, this is also building long-term brand value, right? because you're basically saying we are working on our brand transition. You're being authentic. You are building a connection with the customer. The customer now knows you for things that they didn't know you for before. They know that you are really focused on you know, your energy transition journey. You have set goals. So one of the things that they also were very clear on is the timelines and how quickly they will achieve the, the, the different goals that they've set, right? That is where communication really comes in to communicate your environmental responsibility, right? And really make sure that people are understanding, okay, this is how quickly we want to get from point A to point B. And when you're being very authentic and, and making sure that you are not overstating or, you know, sort of like greenwashing things, you build 
very, very authentic connections with your customers that then say, okay, well, but these guys are being real, right? They can't just stop all of their, you know, brown energy business, but they want to do that over time. And this is how they're going to do it. So that story of how we're going to transition is very, very clearly communicated, right? Um, they also very clearly communicate how they are using different types of impact initiatives to drive social change, right? So they are also looking at how do they nudge customer um, consumer behavior changes and how do they make sure that their, their um, business also supports social causes. And they have, you know, picked causes that really, when you look at sort of the, um, I think they have four pillars for their sustainability ambition. And when you look at those four pillars, the causes are so nicely aligned that, you know, you're just like, okay, there was real thought that went into this, right? And this is what we really talk about when we talk about brand integration from an ESG um, and sustainability perspective. And that means that you're managing stakeholder expectations across board. You are integrating these expectations into your marketing um, and you're you know, really looking at how do you drive growth? And one of the brands that really has you know, sort of done really well with integrating brand um, marketing as well as their ESG ambition and their comms, again, is Apple. And I'm going to show another quick um, video, which many of you may have already seen. The video is basically um, the um, a video of um, Apple's um, 2023 um, sustainability um, campaign. So I don't know whether you also noticed at the end of the video, the leaf on top of the apple was green, right? Um, and, you know, if you have some time, we'll share the link to their um, sort of sustainability page on, on here as well in, in the chat. But basically, you know, this is a, a way of combining brand marketing as well as reporting on your sustainability and also informing customers about your ambitions when it comes to your ESG or sustainability, you know, promises, right? So five minutes and they have talked about every single ESG metric that there is to measure when it comes to carbon net neutrality. They have also launched a new product and promised that all of their products by 2030 will be carbon neutral, right? Um, to me, again, you know, sort of marketing gold and absolute genius, right? Because you have engaged, you have, you know, communicated what your brand stands for. You have made sure that your, you know, the sustainability and the sustainability focus of your brand is clear to all of the stakeholders, right? You have shown that you're socially as well as um, environmentally friendly and you, know, you really are focused on ethical practices, environmental stewardship, and all of that packed into five minutes while you launch a new product, which um, obviously the sales were um, you know, off the charts. So, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about, you know, sort of brand marketing and meeting sustainability. And all of this is sport business, right? So when you think about sustainability, that is your um, either your sustainability committee that's discussing that, or if you have a strategy committee that's discussing that, but you definitely have one of your board committees that is actually looking at um, your ESG metrics, your sustainability ambition. What role does marketing play in there, right? Do you have an ESG integration strategy? Are you looking at how to really engage your customers across your communication channels, across your um, brand marketing and across your product in order to really tell that story and talk about the ambition that you're driving from a you know, sustainability perspective? So last but not least, we'll go into the role of marketing and governance. So I've already sort of alluded a little bit to, you know, governance serving as the compass um, that guides, you know, sort of decision making and actions around marketing. 
Um, it also makes sure that you're mitigating risk, um, ensuring strategic alignment, and really fostering a, a culture of accountability um, in your communications and in your um, marketing. So when you look at sort of like what are the components for effective brand marketing um, and the governance thereof, you really think about and we've mentioned this multiple times, a clear marketing strategy and clear objectives, right? Um, strategic alignment with your business goals. And I think we've said this at least 10 times, but it is really, really important, right? Marketing is not that nice to have standalone thing that, you know, is run by a small group of people the same way that, you know, when we think about technology, it's also not, you know, it's not a project when you think about digital transformation. Um, marketing is strategic right um you have to have a robust planning and approval process right and going back to the balenciaga campaign clearly planning went out the window approvals went out the window and it caused massive massive reputational risk and i'm sure that as a post-mortem they would really look at their processes really look at how they even define, you know, the, the brand, what they want to stand for, their brand values, they will go back to basics and really do the foundational work that needs to be done. You know, and when we talk to clients, we always talk to them about their governance of their marketing, right? And a lot of clients are like, mm, you know, all these extra things that you want us to do. Um, and I think sometimes they maybe think that, okay, maybe these guys just want to collect extra money. And in as much as it's a service that we charge for, it is actually the foundation of how to ensure that your brand marketing has structure, that your brand marketing will always go in the right direction, whether you change people in the organization or not. We've worked with organizations where, you know, the whole marketing team has changed within 12 months. And that brings a lot of challenges along, right? Because that means that there's new visions, new missions, new, you know, focus. Um, and but if you have a brand strategy that is aligned with your business strategy, then there are really no questions to ask. And if you have the right governance process, then there are also no questions to ask, right? So even when you think about it from a perspective of who owns the website, right? And a lot of organizations, technology owns the website. Is that the right place, right? A website that is constantly changing, a website that is constantly evolving. Who should really have ownership of that? Who should be able, when you have multiple departments, multiple, you know, sort of subsidiaries, how do you make sure that the website is updated with the right type of information across these different people? You need to have a proper governance structure for who can edit, who can publish, who has to review, right, um, before you can, you know, sort of go live with that type of thing. If not, you, you know, just have a risk of, a lot of reputational damage, a lot of wrong information out there um, and brand misalignment. So you also have to look at, you know, sort of like compliance and risk management from both a legal perspective. Um, and there's like a lot of compliance around data governance and, and privacy that needs to be really taken into consideration, especially with, um, you know, rules like NDPR coming out. Um, and now being, you know, in law, um, which means that you really need to look at what are you collecting? What are the permissions that people are giving you? Are you collecting permissions from people to use their data? Um, and, and what are you doing in terms of any kind of data governance and privacy compliance? And when you look at how, you know, sort of marketing departments are broader structured, there is that compliance person and risk person in marketing as well, right? That person is not sort of separate and in, in part of internal audit. Um, you want to make sure that you're measuring performance. And, you know, I, we already talked about data and analytics. You want to allocate, you know, the right type of resources from a people perspective, from a budget perspective, um, and from any other perspective that you need to look at resources, you have to make sure that you have cross-functional collaboration. I explained that earlier. And you have to ensure that you have talent development and training. So a really robust L&D strategy is something that, you know, should be addressed when you look at your uh, marketing governance and making sure that you have com uh, continuous improvement and adaptability as well, right? So how do you constantly review your brand strategy, your brand marketing um, implementation and action plan? And how do you make sure that you're using the data that's coming out of it to actually 
change and improve processes to drive performance, right? So you want to make sure that your customer acquisition cost is coming down. You want to make sure that your customer lifestyle, lifetime value is going up. You want to make sure that you have more um, positive brand sentiment. You want to make sure that you are driving engagement, right? But if you are not improving your processes and you keep doing the same thing, you're not going to suddenly have different results. Sorry. Um, so what should a board focus on, right? Um, and this is, you know, the way that we've kind of um, broken this down is into what is the strategic focus for the board? What role does the board oversight play? And what questions should board members be asking, right? So alignment with business strategy is a very key focus um, of the board. And from a board oversight perspective, you should be ensuring that marketing strategies align with the overall business strategy and contribute to the achievement of organizational goals. So some questions that you should be asking is, how does the current marketing um, strategy support the broader business objectives? Are there misalignments that need to be addressed, right? If you're not asking those foundational questions, you know, and you're just sort of diving into, oh, this is what the marketing plan is, then you don't even know if there's alignment, right? You want to look at your compliance risk uh, management. So making sure that you're actually monitoring your marketing activities to ensure compliance with legal and regulatory uh, requirements. And really also looking at how do you address potential risks associated with your marketing initiatives? Is your marketing team actually aware of the risks that they um, you know, are exposing the organization to with this? So questions you want to ask it, what measures are in place to ensure marketing compliance? with relevant laws and regulations? Is there a comprehensive risk management plan and risk register um, that make sure that we're aware of potential issues, right? How is the organization identifying and mitigating potential marketing risks? From a data governance and privacy um, compliance perspective, you wanna make sure that you're using data, um, your customer data, in a responsible and ethical manner and that you address any kind of data privacy concerns and compliance. So you wanna ask questions like, how is customer data handled in marketing activities? What measures are in place to protect your customer privacy and the organization's, um, is the organization compliant with data protection regulations, right? Um, you also wanna look at resource allocation and budget management and really review and approve marketing budgets. This should be something that is done at board level um, you want to make sure that all the resources are allocated strategically and that the budgets are managed um, responsibly. So how are your marketing budgets determined and approved, right? That should be a really big question, right? So you come and present a marketing budget, but how did we actually derive at that, right? What was the process? Is there a clear process um, for this resource allocation and is spending aligned with our strategic priorities and you know are we actually looking at what works and what doesn't work and are we tracking our return on investment to make sure that the next year we can allocate resources in a much smarter manner we also want to look at performance measures um, and analytics and you know we've kind of talked about different kpis and metrics um, as we've gone along but you really want to understand what are the KPIs that you should be looking at for effective um, implementation of your strategies. So questions you want to ask, what KPIs are being used to measure marketing performance? And sometimes, like I mentioned earlier, is it, the KPIs that are important to a marketing team are very different from the KPIs that are important to a board, right? Especially when you think about long-term um, you know, value creation for the business. Um, what a board may be tracking is very, very different which means that the marketing team also needs to understand what are the strategic levers that the board would look at in order to actually be able to report on those uh, KPIs. How is the board informed about the impact of marketing initiatives and what actions are taken based on performance data, right? So when campaigns don't go well, what do we do, right? How do we take different actions? How do we adapt? How do we tweak what we're doing? Cross-functional collaboration is another strategic focus. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're um, co encouraging collaboration between your marketing team and other functional areas to really have that holistic approach across the organization. So 
questions you can ask is how is collaboration facilitated between marketing and other departments? Are there mechanisms in place to ensure cross-functional communication and coordination? Um, and like I mentioned, this is really important because marketing is not a standalone function. Talent development and training is another focus. Um, and here you really want to ensure that marketing teams have access to relevant training and development opportunities to enhance skills and knowledge. Questions you may want to ask is what initiatives are in place for talent development with, um, within the marketing team? How is the board informed about the skills and expertise of the marketing personnel? You want to make sure that the board also has feedback on the growth of the team and the development of the team and how you know the money that is being spent on L&D is actually helping with um, sustainable brand growth. Continuous improvement and adaptability. You want to foster a culture of continuous improvement within the marketing fun function and really make sure that it also responds to market dynamics. So here you could ask things like, how does the organization promote a culture of continuous improvement in marketing? Is the marketing team adaptive to changes in technology, consumer behavior, and industry um, trends? So there are a couple of more focus areas like customer centricity. Here you wanna ensure that organizational strategies, operations and decision-making prioritize and align with the needs and expectations of your customers and really enhance the long-term value of competitiveness. Um, so you wanna ask questions like, how does this marketing decision prioritize and enhance the customer experience, right? Have your customer feedback and preferences been considered in the decision-making process? Sometimes we make decisions without actually consulting customers. So one of the important things that Bella mentioned about the um, Think Different campaign is that the campaign was actually shown to stakeholders before it launched, right? To make sure that they had the right kind of feedback and were able to tweak in case they had gone in the wrong direction, right? So it's really important to really also think how from a customer centricity perspective, you involve your customers to co-create and to ensure that they um, really buy into what it is that you're putting out there, right? And sometimes you need to experiment a little bit. Sometimes you can have focus groups. Sometimes you, um, you know, can do surveys to, to get responses. Sometimes your customer support data, if you analyze it, will actually tell you exactly what customers are looking for and what they want, right? So again, looking at how you use data to drive customer centricity is key. Um, okay, I think th these are repetition. So we will go over to the key learnings. Um, so brand marketing is a strategic business function that directly affects shareholder value. And that's why we're here, right? We wanna understand um, how we use um, strategic brand marketing to mitigate risk. We want to make sure that we're using brand marketing to um, enhance our sustainability efforts. And we want to make sure that boards are actively engaged and really understand the role of brand marketing. So here are a couple of key learnings that we've sort of put together, and then we'll go over to questions. So your brand is your most valuable asset, right? Um, it's and also an intangible asset, right? So sometimes you have, you hear of valuations and the valuations are kind of crazy and you're like, okay, but when you look at the PNL, you look at the balance sheet, this company isn't really worth that much, but the value of the brand is actually massive, right? Um, and that is what is then, you know, sort of being included into that valuation. So board members really need to recognize um, the brand's impact on shareholder value and overall financial health of an organization, right? And you have to be really clear that reputational damage or any kind of negative mention of your brand can really dip shareholder value and wipe out, you know, billions of dollars. And when you look at, you know, sort of, Elon Musk, as he was acquiring X, that acquisition, um, you know, actually reduced share value of Tesla stocks, right? Just because he's the owner of that. And people were like, oh, he's not going to be able to focus on Tesla. And he was tweeting all sorts of things that people didn't really align with and didn't really like. Um, and, you know, it wasn't really clear to them what exactly he was trying to achieve and what he really wanted to do. So the shares dipped and he lost a couple of billion dollars, right? 
Um, and other people obviously also lost um, money as those shares did, right? They recovered eventually, but, you know, communication is key. There could have been better communication around that acquisition and around his role within Tesla and within, um, you know, that acquisition and how he was going to, you know, sort of manage both in order to make sure that shareholders are really clear on, okay, our money is safe and, you know, we don't need to panic sell. We don't need to, um, you know, be scared. Of, of what's going to happen next. Strategic importance. So brand marketing is not just a promotional tool, it's a strategic lever, and it shapes the company's identity, influence customer perception, and really drives long-term uh, growth. There has to be alignment with your business strategy and your brand marketing strategy. So as a board, you need to make sure that you're really ensuring coherence and maximizing the impact of marketing over um, on overall organizational goals. There's a direct link to growth. Um, so effective brand marketing directly contributes to business growth by attracting and retaining customers, fostering brand loyalty, and differentiating the company in the competitive landscape. Also, one of the key takeaways is that you need to make sure that you're mitigating your risk um, in brand marketing, right? So have a brand marketing risk register. Um, make sure that you understand the severity of the risk, right? Um, make sure that you have, you know, especially when it comes to reputation management, that you have plans in place, right? There have been organizations where because they didn't have a plan in place, where they were being attacked from, you know, competitors or from even shareholders within. Um, and because of that, they lost, you know, shareholder value. They were not able to really focus. Their responses were all over the place, right? So when you look at a company like Enron, for example, right? Um, when the oil spill happened, um, you know, the Enron CEO, um, you know, kind of went on TV. He wasn't prepared. He hadn't been briefed and he was just kind of talking, right? And he created, caused so much damage to the reputation of the company simply because the message wasn't coherent. In the end, his board even threw him under the bus, right? And we were like, we don't know what this guy is talking about, um, you know, because it obviously then went to the White House, to the Senate, um, and became this, you know, sort of um, emergency, you know, I guess, a national emergency in the US. So really thinking about, do we have, from a reputational risk perspective, a plan in place that, and have we done a board simulation that actually helps us understand what reputational risk can do for us? If today you get hacked and they take all your data, all your customer data, what will that do to your reputation, right? This customer data was attained through brand marketing. Um, so, but here you actually have exposure to cyber risk but that cyber risk very quickly snowballs into reputational risk, right? And when you look at, um, you know, sort of the reason why GDPR um, and NDPR have evolved, it is exactly that, right? So much data loss, um, data being leaked, data being misused, um, that has then led to reputational risk for these organizations that are actually doing that. So really being clear on, on how you mitigate risks and what the risks actually are, making sure that you're customer centric um, and ensuring that really your brand marketing places the customer at the center, understands their needs, their preferences, expectations, and that you create compelling and resonant messaging right across the different stakeholder groups that you have. Making sure that as a board, you are making strategic inquiries, right? Um, that help to guide your marketing oversight and governance. So you have to proactively engage with your marketing team, your CMO, um, by asking informed questions, by asking for specific things to be included in your um, board reports. And also by making sure that you have access to the right type of data and that the organization is utilizing data analytics and brand marketing um, in brand marketing to really enable informed decision-making and allow you as a board member to measure the effectiveness of marketing efforts and really ensure that over time, strategies continue to be optimized for better results. And the last two learnings are really the focus on continuous adoption to market dynamics 
So brand marketing should be agile, right? The marketing space is changing. The business space is ever changing. There's a lot of geopolitical um, changes that are happening that are affecting, you know, brands um, all over the place. So you really have to really think about, you know, how are these different changes actually changing also your consumer behavior and how are they um, changing your positioning and how do you remain relevant and competitive in this ever changing and very dynamic environment? And lastly, marketing is a driver for growth and sustainability. So marketing plays a really big role when it comes to sustainability um, and ESG. And, you know, we talked about um, ESG and sustainability brand integration um, and how businesses have used that to really drive um, not just their um, brand image, but also to drive awareness of their sustainability um, metrics um, and, and, and their sustainability um, commitments and, and, and promises, right? And you want to make sure that your customers know about those type of things so that you can make sure that you're really embracing sustainable marketing practices that align with societal values and again, sort of your long-term objectives. And those are the learnings for today. Um, just to quickly mention before we take questions um, at FutureSoft, we offer a lot of um, brand strategy focused services um, that range from brand audits to brand strategy, brand optimization. We do brand sprints, um, integrated marketing comms, digital marketing, corporate branding, go-to-market strategy, as well as executive and um, leadership training, both at board level, um, as well as for marketing teams to make sure that you know, they understand new trends like ESG brand integration, to make sure that you know, um, they are aware and that that LMD element that we talked about is actually served. So with that, I want to say thank you um, from me and Bella, and we will be happy to take some questions. So you can just put your questions in the chat. Um, I see there are quite a few comments um, I'll go through. Okay. Everybody is loving the video. Um, yeah, and that's, that's it, right? Um, it's a video that is actually not that you know, like when it comes to the information that is being shared, right? It's not actually sexy, right? But the way that it's been done is just, you know, absolute genius, right? Because they, you know, from the music that is being used to the little elements like the plant that, you know, sort of like went back to being fully green at the end, um, you know, to jokes being integrated they had all the components for making this thing go viral um across multiple audiences right so young people watched it because they were like oh apple has released this video and it's supposed to be really cool older people watched it because they were like wow this is a sustainability report in five minutes in video format this is innovative right um so yeah there's like bella said the sheer attention to detail across you know so many of the brand values and parameters is just really, um, really amazing. So let's see, do we have any questions here? Okay, here's a question. Beyond having a brand strategy, you must first own your brand. You must have legal exclusivity of your brand um, by registering um, a trademark. Yes, so I think it, it really depends um, on, you know, sort of the, the type of brand. Not every brand has a, a trademark on on their um, on their logo or um, on their brand, but it is a, a useful um, thing to have. But you also have to make sure that you're really looking at it from a global perspective because today's, um, you know, sort of world just isn't local anymore. Okay. All right. So do we have any questions? Um, there's some questions from the, you know, we had asked people to fill out in the questionnaire. And also there are some questions that I feel like we need to just answer pointedly, even though we've spoken to them throughout the entire um, class and all, you know, and then one of the ones that kept on reoccurring is on how to sell benefits of long-term value creation to the board 
over the focus of quick wins. So I don't know how much time you have for this answer, but I'll try and do it in a few minutes because this is one of the biggest issues that we have with clients. And what I'll say is that first of all, you need to be realistic, right? And why I say realistic is because at the end of the day, like I said at some point in, in, in the slides, is that what you're looking at as a member of the marketing team is not what the board is looking out for. And you know, for certain expenditure, it has to go to the board. You can't just, you know, you can't just go through your budget. It has to go through board approval. So what you need to do, and I'm going to quote what one of my clients said um, a few years ago is, hey, Bella, I understand that you want me to be this amazing brand, but I need to be alive today. So my advice is, even with, because you know how your board thinks or how management team thinks, I'm not sure if this is just the board you're speaking to because some other person asked about the management team as well, is that you need to be strategic and create your plans and programs in such a way that there are quick wins, right? But quick wins that are foundational, not quick wins that can go around and bite you because they are quick wins that at the end of the day, when measured vis-a-vis -vis the business strategy, is neither here nor there, and it becomes yet one more way marketing is misusing funds, you know? So it's, it's I, I think for this, even the entire marketing department has to really rethink how they present things because that is why marketing is always the first budget that gets caught. Unfortunately, I still don't understand it, but that is the way, that is the way of the world. And it behoves practitioners like us to say, okay, do you know what? If I present it in this manner, so if for instance, you're, and this is where Martin needs to also ask questions as well, there needs to be pushback. If you are being, if you're creating a strategy for a one year or a three year period, and you do not have clear KPIs or a clear understanding of the business strategic goals for the same period, please push back, ask the right questions. Because if not, at some point, there might be some alignment because it's the same business, but at some point you're going to go off on a tangent and now not be fully aligned with where the board is going and therefore not get the approval. But something I can tell you for sure is when you get strategic and begin to present your plans in a way that there are quick wins that keep the board inspired and motivated and look at it on a quarterly basis. Remember the board sits quarterly. Look at it on a quarterly basis where you can quickly show in your reports. I'm hoping your marketing is part of the board pack. You, know, you can finish as an okay, Q1, this happened, Q2, this happened. And then again, historical data. If you did something differently in Q1, 2023, can you go back and see what happened in Q1, 2022 and make some kind of inference so that automatically they're thinking as, ah, okay, if our strategic goal, for instance, is to open up new branches in Southwest, what data can you prove to show that, okay, this may be 50 million I'm asking for, to be able to run this campaign in the Southwest is going to live on X, Y, Z. It's by historical data, do you see? So it just, the thing is, it's a lot of work, but it's work that when done right, you can easily become a superstar to the board and the, the organization in, in general. So I hope that um, answers the question. And then um, I think also something that can be used, I think also if you watch the replay, the same table in Kem showed that had the strategic focus and the questions the board should ask. I think reverse engineer it if you're a practitioner in market and say, okay, if the board is going to ask these questions, what information can I provide to answer those questions? And then again, you need to understand that because a lot of board members don't have marketing experience, you have to position information such that it also educates and illuminates um, concepts as it delivers on the strategic focus of the board. So I think there's a lot of reporting and how you present reports is very, very important. And who says you can't create a video for the entire board to watch? Who says? You know. I hope that helps. Okay. Oh, Accordion says it helps. Okay, cool. Um, I think okay, there was another question, I think, around sensitivity on how to leverage opportunities. Like how does brand marketing help a brand to leverage opportunities? I'm assuming that these opportunities have to maybe, I don't know, in the in the country, in the environment, 
I'm, I'm suspecting. I don't know if it's because it's Val's day. I don't know if that's <laughs> an opportunity the person was thinking about, you know, but, but I think it's a, it's a valid question. Yeah, definitely. And I, I mean, I think that, you know, there are, there are different types of opportunities. There may be opportunities to strategically position yourself for a new line of business, right? When you think about the Total Energies um, case that I was talking about, right? That is where brand marketing played a really big role in transitioning the business, right? So, and unlocking new opportunities um, in, in the renewable energy space um, and, and also unlocking completely new um customers right um and when you look at the ads you'll see that a lot of the ads are actually focused more on on the you know sort of b2c part of the consumer right um in terms of electric charging stations in terms of um you know sort of um using more sustainable energy for your cars and I think this is really where you um, need to kind of look at your brand marketing and your business strategy side by side and really look at, okay, what is the ambition over the next couple of years? What are the opportunities that we're looking to unlock? How do we need to position ourselves, right? So whether this is trying to position yourselves for a merger and acquisition, or you're trying to position yourself to serve a new market segment or unlock an entire new customer base, I think it's important to make sure that your strategies from a marketing perspective actually drive that, right? It's very um, easy to, you know, sort of just have campaigns, but what are you doing, you know, in terms of building foundational content that is actually positioning you over time, right? What are you doing to tell your story? What are you doing to make sure that you um, have a good view on the, the sort of kind of like business trends and how the business landscape is is also evolving. So I think it's really important, you know, and, and, and actually a really good point, right? So opportunities, you know, especially from a board perspective are never short-term like a Valentine's Day. They're always very long-term in terms of strategic business positioning for growth, right? So you could say, okay, we want to be very aggressive on acquisitions. We want to be the champion for customer um, focus. We want to be known for innovation, right? So that is not something that happens overnight, right? It's something that happens over time. Um, and when you just, you know, sort of compare the 1997 Apple video to the 2023 Apple video, right? It's such a big difference, right? Um, and, but still the, the brand, and ethos. the brand ethos, yeah, is still exactly the same, right? And you can feel it and you can hear it, you can see it, um, you know, and I think that's really where, you know, sort of that sustainable brand marketing also comes in where you're building a brand for that long-term value creation and not just, you know, sort of for, for today. So I think it's really about, you know, sort of making sure that marketing actually understands what is that long-term value that you want to unlock? Do you want to go into a new country? Okay, so you want to go into Francophone Africa. Do you have your website in French? As basic as that, right? If brand marketing is not pushing that and creating content in French, then you know, like you're not going to actually be able to unlock that market segment. So there has to be a strategy behind whatever your business strategy is and how marketing supports that. I think just adding to that before I go to the next question is the same way I think. The way you structure working with your agency and the marketing units, and this is across branding, marketing, communications, and all of that is the same way you have like midterm and long-term strategies, three-year, five-year strategies, is the same way after they are approved and agreed upon, what the, the, the business strategy I mean, you now give that to marketing, branding, and comms, depending on how it's structured, if you have everything internally, or if it's a mix of external agencies as well as internal teams so that they produce a three-year, five-year, whatever duration for the same period for which the overarching goals um, of the business have been created so that that way you see the alignment and you know what is foundational. Because I'll tell you something, you have to be prepared for the future. There's a client we're currently working with now and they have just shared their 2023 to 2026 strategic vision and there is a program we are starting in March, but it is an 18 month duration thing to be able to report on it by 2025, you see. So there's a lot of um, strategic intent 
behind these things. And then to go over to the next question, just looking at the questions that came through the questionnaire, is somebody saying storytelling seems to be, have become everything. So how does this work? How do you sell this to the board? So yes, storytelling has become everything. And again, remember what we said in one of the first few slides, and it is simply because it is marketing in the digital era. So you, there's so much content being produced. So you must understand your customer. Your customer is consuming all kinds of content from all manner of places. So if you don't tell not just a story, but a compelling story, you are not going to get any attention. Let's go back again to the Apple videos. The one on sustainability was what? Four minutes, 41 seconds. Can you imagine if that was in written form? Can you just imagine who would have read that? Or how many people would have read that without very serious motivation, you know? And then it touched on, like I said earlier, so many brand parameters. So essentially that video is also, it's a brand story. That is Apple's brand story on sustainability. So I'm gonna push the question back to, you know, whoever submitted that question. What is your brand story? What are you about? And a brand story goes beyond what you do, how you do it. It is the why, but I'm gonna add a second layer to that. It is your why communicated in a way that it matters to your stakeholders. Because if your why is that you want to make the world a better place, all well and good. But how can you communicate that why to your different stakeholder segments so that by the time you're making the world a better place, is a more expensive price point than other brands in your category, you can explain it in a way that it makes sense, is compelling and inspires action by the customer who is going to pay a marked increase. If it is to your vendors and suppliers, how do you communicate that information? Remember what um, Tim Cook said about having about 300 other suppliers signing to make clean renewable, um, to use clean renewable energy in the operations. That is also how you nudge behavior and get other people within your ecosystem to buy into what you're selling, you know? So I think as in, it's a case of getting creative and then doing the work. Brand audits, do an audit of your brand. Remember Apple, at any point where their logo was not serving them, they changed. And as they changed the logo, it translated across the entire brand and was tied to revenue, shareholder value, and all of that at every point in time. We showed you just three transitions because they were the most marked transitions. But Apple, I think, has, I believe, has had about nine logos in total, you know. So sometimes, and this is me pleading with Nigerian and African brands, if something is no longer serving you, why are you holding on to it? If you think about it, what we've heard today, if your logo is no longer serving you, why are you holding on to it? If your customer's perception of you is no longer serving you now or no longer serving your midterm, long-term vision, maybe you should start telling a different story to bring them on board so that by the time you begin to look at the metrics to indicate if you are moving in the right direction, you have the data inputs to expect the right data outputs. You know, So this is one place where I think technology businesses have done so much for business in general. In fact, they've done so much for trade and everything in general because they forced regular businesses to think about things they weren't ordinarily thinking about. So they came up with you know, the churn rates, customer lifetime value and all these things. But essentially these are things that should matter to any kind of business. So I think sometimes for the board and even with practitioners internally at um, agencies and internally within organizations is to look at it like tech isn't this big crazy thing that you don't know about. Try and understand so you can adapt to change because guess what? Whether or not you get on board, the train is right on moving down, you know? So get acquainted um, with this. And then I think to the last thing I'll say on this point as well is be vulnerable and be honest with yourself. If any, for the CMOs in this room and for the boards that don't have well-structured marketing departments, is the role of the CMO is changing. It is changing. It will, gone are the days when CMO just focused on uh, promoting uh, brand activations, 
marketing collateral and all of that. Now, CMOs have to look beyond all of that to think about growth, to think about revenue, even in some businesses, even tax. <laughs> How do we create campaigns and products and things to ensure that our tax liabilities are kept to a minimum? You know, so going at those days, I think also be vulnerable and be honest about the things you need to learn so that even with the l and when the board or is requested of you as, okay, so how do we upskill your units? You have done the work as a CMO, say, okay, look, my units based on the business strategy, the business strategic goals cannot deliver on X, Y, Z because we do not have X, Y, Z. And that is how, if you want to now get external help from agencies, you know exactly what you're looking for from an agency. Because a lot of the time, people work with agencies, you know, just because, oh, this other uh, organization used them, I like the, how, what they did, I like the adverts that they did. But look, I think to yourself, based on my growth ambition, what do I need as a business? And who will take me, who will be the bridge to take me from where I am now to where um, I want to go as a business? And this is something that the board must think about because with the jackpot wave and everything, talent is such a huge issue because one day you can wake up and you don't have an entire brand marketing comms department and your agency, the owner of the agency might have jackpot as well. <laughs> you know? So yeah, funny, but these are actually true life situations that we've seen happen. In yeah, recent so that is a question in the chat and um, it says, how do you assess if your logo is still connecting with the target audience? Hmm. Research. Your target audience, ask them. You know, we Nigerian brands, African brands tend to shy away from research, you know, but we just need, we need to ask the questions. You need to ask because should you assume it could be dead on arrival, I need to give you this story. Gap, the Gap in America, they changed their logo. And when it came, everyone was like, hey, who's this? What's going on? And everybody just bailed. And believe it or not, they went back to their old logo. You know, so things like that actually happen. So, you know, ask, ask, your, ask your, 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 your target audience. But one tip, another tip I'll add is across the different stakeholder segments. Ask, so if you have six different stakeholders, and for stakeholders, it's internal and external. So customer across staff, the employees, the board, um, the different customer segments. So if you have like different customer segments, you ask, there's representation from each and every one of them. So that, that way, like I said, something brands do a lot, you don't alienate any important stakeholder segment in favor of another one that could end up becoming a potential, a huge potential risk to, to the organization. The person, I'm hoping you're on the call because the question is quite interesting. And it says, how brand marketing affects market entry and go-to-market strategy for premium niche customers? Well, I would say, Go watch the Apple video. <laughs> you know, the first one we showed, you know, but on a more serious um, note, I think it's research. African and Nigerian brands, let's stop shying away from research, from audits, you know, let's stop shying away from building out actual strategies that are not just lifting what you did last year, tweaking it a bit and bringing it into this year. This is something we see all the time, you know, and there are some brands that if I call, you recognize them very easily, who literally just move things from 2021 to 2022 to 2023, 24, having a complete disconnect with their target audience. And like I said very early in the um, presentation, that is why they get disrupted very quickly and very easily. So you must have a firm um, finger on the pulse of, of, of your stakeholders. And also, I would say, as in, in, in investing in some research, you know, industry research, sector research, and then focus groups, independent, direct interviews. These things might sound old school, but they are still quite um, efficient. And yeah, I, I think just to add on that as well, I mean, there are also sentiment analysis tools, um, you know, that are really focused on the African market, like Versus, for example, um, that you can use to, you know, get more insights from actual users of your um you know product 
um, or just, you know, from, from the general public. So I think it's really important to also, you know, kind of look at how do you get that sentiment data without being biased? Because what a lot of us do is go to customers who we know are already happy and then do a survey and then we're like yeah we've done really well and you know we're very well positioned um but the truth is that you know when you really look at what people are saying on x what people are saying across your social media channels the type of customer service complaints that you're getting if you used all of the people who gave you negative feedback maybe you would get a different um you know sort of um response to to the questions that you're asking so you need to make sure that you have a good mix of people who are already loyal to your brand and who love your brand but also people who have had major issues with your brand and i think that you can get really through sort of using independent tools so you know leverage technology as well leverage data that is accessible and out there in order to get feedback and really take that feedback on i think sometimes you know um and, and this is just as people i guess you know, someone tells you something and you're like, mm, what does that person know, right? Um, but the truth is that, you know, people see you um, and, and how you how you look, how you act. And, you know, they, they have um, they have a very different vantage point than you have as you are within that, you know, experience and within that organization, right? I mean, we're always going to love our organizations and, you know, think that we're the best thing since sliced bread. But the truth is that sometimes we need to hear from other people outside, you know, that, okay, you guys are old fashioned or you guys need to evolve. You guys are not for young people. You guys are not for this. You guys don't appeal to X, Y, Z, right? And I think that that type of feedback is so invaluable that you really need to, you know, go look for it out there um, to make sure that you are able to embed it into your brand marketing strategy over time. Okay, so I think there's one last question on what are in, what could be possible immediate next steps for the board and for marketers. So. Um, maybe I'll take it from the board perspective and then you can talk about it from the marketing perspective. I think from possible next steps for every board is to really analyze how much visibility they have on marketing at this point, right? And then sort of chart a roadmap to how do you get there, right? Um, like you mentioned, the board meets quarterly, which means that progress sometimes is slow. Um, it also means that if you don't have a board member that really understands marketing and has deep skills, you need to um, acquire those skills first, right? So you need to make sure that your board is learning. You need to, to make sure that um, you know, you're building the, the skills that are required for you to actually start engaging on a strategic level and making those strategic um, strategic um, inquiries, right? And you, you need to make sure that your CMO is ready to actually create reports that are relevant to the board, which means that at board level, you need to be clear on what are the metrics that you want to track as a board, right? What is important to you? What is important to the bottom line? What is important in terms of br tracking brand value, in terms of tracking actual return on investment, in, tracking, in terms of tracking customer lifetime value? There's so many different things that you can look at and track. And sometimes if you track the wrong thing, then you know you are are kind of like winking in the dark um, and nobody is seeing you. So it's important, I think, for boards to first of all be ready to have oversight across marketing. And then if you're already doing that, I think just to really review, you know, what is it that we're looking at, uh, all of the different, you know, risks, uh, are we mitigating against them? Um, and then also from a the perspective of um, you know, do are we agile enough? Are we adapting enough? Are we tweaking our strategy? Is this current strategy that we have in brand marketing really focused on sustainability as well? Is the current strategy that we have in brand marketing aligned to our business goals over the next five years? And if it's not, then you need to just probably do a, a brand audit um, uh, or, you know, sort of commission a brand audit and then take the results of that brand audit to really dig deep into a new brand strategy that then the board um, approves and 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 the marketing team can start implementing and then you know you track against that so I think it, it really depends sort of what stage you're at um, as a board and how much oversight you already have but if you're at the very beginning you need to just put 
the foundational things in place. If you've already, you know, sort of um, gotten to a more mature space, it's just to continuously evolve. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then from the marketing perspective, I'm going to take it from running an agency and then as well as being internal and speak to two points that appeal to both because I'm not really sure um, what would be most um, efficient for the whoever asked the question. So the two things, it is number one, be very well acquainted with the organization's business strategy. Understand that document, fully understand that document. That is the only way you will create relevance and maintain relevance, whether as an internal team member or as an agency. Because a lot of the time, even with these business strategies, depending on what even the executive team is putting in the board pack, the board sometimes has blind spots on certain you know, matters. But because there is a document that is guiding everybody, which is the approved business strategy document or policies, whatever, you know, that is a document that will always be referred to. So if you as the internal or external marketing team is able to tie everything or whatever you are doing to that document, you would likely always get buy-in and that is how you create change. And also be very realistic about timelines. If the strategic document says, for instance, that something will be done or some kind of market share, for instance, words like market share. Market share will be achieved in five years. And you know, I say, hmm, from where we are now and how our customers feel about us, this is not even possible. But again, because you want to be strategic is to make that clear with your reporting and your actions, but also have a stance of, even though that might not be possible, but show incremental market share based on the activities and the programs that you are undertaking. And then the second one is data. Internal and external marketing teams, you have to get very comfortable with data. I know it's not, it's not, it's not pretty, <laughs> it's not fun, but you have to get extremely comfortable with data and sifting through different um, various um, kinds of data. But what I would just say is that as you go through data, you might need external help to help you understand what data points should be collecting, at what points of the customer journey should be collecting the data, and how it matters to the different stakeholders, the interpretation of, of this data. You know, So I think as in two things I'll leave you with is getting comfortable with data and having absolute understanding, appreciation, and consideration of the business's um, business strategy. And this is not just for um, profit business, even across you know, uh, non-governmental social enterprises, whatever it is, at the end of the day, every entity always has its strategic objective. So once you understand that document and you're comfortable with data around what you're trying to achieve and where you've been, then there will always, there will always, always, always be, be progress and success. Okay, so I think as I don't see anything else coming. Um, yeah, so I think there's just a, a question about um, the um, whether this is a series, and you know I've sort of already responded to say that we have quarterly masterclasses like this, but we also have biweekly lunch and learns. Also, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, which I'll put in the chat shortly, um, you'll you know be able to. Um, also watch so i'll we'll share that in the um in the chat dara are you here can you please put that in the chat
Dara will share the link to the um, session sign up shortly. All right, um, I found the link and I've shared it as well. So if you go on there and sign up, then you would get um, alerts whenever there is a lunch and learn. And you can go on the YouTube link that I shared before that to look at the different um, sessions that we have. Some of the master classes that we've done in the past are on that YouTube channel as well. So, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us. Um, so that you get alerts when we publish new videos so that you always abreast. Um, and if you want to join the live sessions, um, you know, sort of just uh, sign up and also follow our social media channels. We always advertise all of our sessions on there as well. Um, and we share it with, you know, anyone that's um, kind of in our community and our network. I hope this helps. All right, perfect. Um, so I think with that, we've exhausted all the questions and are able to finish a little bit ahead of time. So thank you everyone um, for your attention. Thank you for those who stayed all the way to the end. Um, you know, we hope that this was an insightful session and the uh, replay will be uploaded um, on the YouTube channel in the next coming days. And once it's up, you'll receive an email um, alerting you that it's been up and please share far and wide, especially with people who sit on boards. It's really important, you know, um, I think for the evolution of brand marketing on the continent to make sure that our boards actually have the right type of um, information and access to information when it comes to, you know, sort of brand marketing and board um exposure so it's really important that we um also share share the information with with other people who may find it relevant so thank you very much um for your time and for joining us this morning and have a great rest of the week bye